Welcome back to another episode of the Abraham Watkins Podcast. My name is Jeffrey Atkinson. I'm the Social Media Marketing Manager here with Abraham Watkins. I'm with partner Brant Stogner. So Brant, you are small town kid, El Campo, Texas. Tell us about kind of how you grew up. We see how, how your stature is with 6'3", six, 6'4", six, so obviously you played football. Kind of tell us about your upbringing a little bit. Okay, so um, obviously grew up uh, in El Campo, Texas, about an hour, hour and a half south of here, dead center between here and Victoria. Mom was an English teacher at the high school. Dad was a local uh, CPA, handled tax returns, audits. Um, it's small town life, right? So what is there to do in a small town? We're a big football town. We're a big baseball town, basketball. So that's what I did. I played sports. My older brother played sports. Uh, my whole family played sports. I've got several cousins playing college football. I've got cousins that played college softball and volleyball. Um, that's what we do. But in addition to the sporting background, uh, with my mom being an English teacher, my grandmother uh, was a teacher, my other grandfather was a principal, so education was also a big part. So um, the two things I was told when I was little, my job was to uh, play sports, work out hard, and most importantly, make good grades. Right. And so, but yeah, and I'm not quite 6'3". It's 6'1", 220. Um, <laughs> some, some different programs have listed me at 6'2", 6'3", but true story, 6'1". Okay. And then after El Campo, you went on to U of H, play, played football? Right. So the problem was, um, am I going to go play college football or am I going to go play college baseball? Um, and at that point in time, in college football, you were getting full scholarships, right? And so, you know, being from a small town, not a bunch of money, a uh, full scholarship would be very helpful to my family, so my sister could go to college as well. And um, so I was trying to choose, am I going to go play baseball, am I going to go play football? Um, I ultimately, um, I tore my knee up my senior year, kind of limited my options, um, but there was one program that stuck with me from start to finish, uh, and that was University of Houston. So in the, when the Cougars offered me a full scholarship back in 1996 or seven, uh, it would have been February of 97, um, I accepted it. Mm -hmm. And you know, at that point in time, the Cougars were going to a bowl game. Uh, I believe that year they went to the Liberty Bowl, played Donovan McNabb, mm -hmm. did very well. Uh, I think only U of H and A&M that year were the only two Texas schools that even went to a bowl game. So I felt like I was on the ground floor at something that was kind of be on the up and up. And so I uh, moved to Houston. I, I reported for football camp in August and um, ended up doing several seasons for the University of Houston. Unfortunately for me, um, I kept getting injured. So I, I you know, recovered from a knee surgery. Uh, the very same surgeon that did my knee surgery in high school was the U of H team surgeon. Mm -hmm. And um, he ultimately operated on me three more times while I was there. And it, was, it became pretty clear to me that, mm -hmm. that I, I wasn't going to make my money. I wasn't, my career was not going to be football. It, it wasn't going to be coaching football. Um, and so once, I, once that, that picture was clear, I decided, look, it's, it's time for a different uh, path, you know, <coughs> different scenery. Um, I didn't want to be the guy that walked around University of Houston campus. Hey, there's mm -hmm. the guy that used to play football, but he mm -hmm. got so many injuries. So I transferred and I mm -hmm. said, hey, I've got 36 hours, I believe I had left. And um, I always wanted to go to Texas A&M. Mm -hmm. And uh, my hometown's big Aggie town. You know, 80% of the folks that went to college in my hometown went to Texas A&M. Mm -hmm. big farming community, uh, military background community. So it's where I wanted to go. Um, and one thing my dad told me um, when I was young is he said, if I had the Aggie ring, mm -hmm. this is my father talking, he says, Brand, if I had the Aggie ring, I would have made so much more money because Aggies, <laughs> Aggies take care of Aggies. Mm -hmm. And that was something that I found to be true growing up. Uh, it was something I found to be true while at Texas A&M. Uh, and it was something I found to be true since. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I often get interviewed uh, for, for clients interviewing me to see if uh, they want to hire me to take their case. And every once in a while, the deciding factor is that I went to Texas A&M. Um, and so I've got another story I'll tell you about here in a minute, how Texas A&M uh, showed up in law school. Mm -hmm. But so ultimately, I transferred A&M. I, uh, I complete my degree. I get a degree in accounting. And then now what, right? What am I going to do now? Mm -hmm. How did you transition to law school? Because you, you didn't come from a family of, of lawyers you said education and hard work in small town, so. That's right. So. Where'd that come from? Well, what happened is, is you know, uh, growing up, my father always talked about how his dream was to be 
He wanted to play college football. Mm -hmm. He wanted to be a trial lawyer. Mm -hmm. And so it's one of those deals when you look up to your father, you know, as your, as your example, as your leader, um, those became my dreams. Right. And, and, um, so I achieved one. I, I, I got my full ride in football. I went and played college football. Um, I wanted to be a trial lawyer, but how do I get there? Right. Mm -hmm. So my degree was in accounting at Texas A&M. I moved back to Houston. I uh, took an accounting job. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, I, I said, this isn't for me either. <laughs> I don't want to do this either. Um, and so then I said, well, I'm going to go to law school. But, but when and how? Right. How do you do that? How do you go to law school? Um, I quit my accounting job. I started bartending mm -hmm. and waiting tables. Mm -hmm. um, I, was old, I was at Sullivan Steakhouse, which is where Steak 48 is now. I was there for, for years uh, bartending and um, trying to find the right time. Problem was, I was making so much money bartending that there was never a right time to go and apply to law school. Mm -hmm. And so I kept missing my application deadline, kept missing it. And it got to the point where I was almost like, didn't care anymore. Mm -hmm. But my dad came up to, uh, to the bar one night when he, was, when he came to Houston. And he just told me, he said, what are you doing? You know, you, you, need to, you need to continue with your dream. You're getting comfortable now. You're making good money, but this isn't long term. Right, and it's not a career. It's not a career, right? You know, the world needs a lot of bartenders. We've heard that forever. And so um, I decided at that point it was time. And so um, I wanted to apply. So I applied uh, to the local Houston law schools. And ultimately, South Texas College of Law accepted me and gave me scholarship money to where it was, it was it was going to be uh, more beneficial for me to go to South Texas than any of the other schools that had accepted me. Right. And so I enrolled at South Texas, missed my financial aid deadline. <laughs> <laughs> and so I had to wait another semester. So one, you know, most folks start law school in the fall. Most folks start school in the fall. That's the normal program. Uh, but because I'd missed my financial aid deadline, I bartended through that, that Christmas and, and I started in January. Mm -hmm. And so when, uh, when I started in law school in January, that put me in a weird small section. Mm -hmm. But lucky for me, that's where I met my wife. She was also a, what's called a spring start. Mm -hmm. She was a spring start with me in 2003 mm -hmm. at South Texas. And we met day one, you know, immediately study buddies um, in the same study group. Um, married to her <laughs> since then. Uh, she works right over there, as mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. um, and so now she works with me here at the law firm and she's, she's my right hand man, for lack of a better term. Mm -hmm. You know, she, she's my um, chief of staff, she's my uh, sergeant at arms, whatever you want to say, but she runs my crew of associates with me, mm -hmm. um, helps mentor them, helps uh, keep the cases moving. But that, that's how I got to law school. Right. Now, my wife, you know, she comes from, uh, my father in law's fantastic lawyer from down in Corpus Christi. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, so when she came to law school, mm -hmm. she knew right away what she wanted to do. She right. was going to get into mock trial and moot court. Right. And I had never heard of those things. <laughs> I had no clue. I didn't do debate in high school because I was busy with sports. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't do collegiate debate or collegiate mock trial like we have some of our associates do. Right. Um, I had no clue what that was. Uh, but what Jennifer said, what my wife told me, is she said, look, that is baseball and football for law school. Right. Okay. This is where you make a varsity team. This is where you go compete against other schools, their varsity team. Right. And I said, that sounds like, that sounds like what I like to do. That sounds like sports. Mm -hmm. um, and so, of course, you know, she was you know, instrumental in getting me to look into the advocacy program. She's there on a full scholarship. Um, and so she and I, we started doing the advocacy programs together. We were lucky enough, because at South Texas, I mean, that's where the best advocates go, usually. Mm -hmm. um, and so just to make the varsity team, just to get to say, hey, I'm one of the guys who goes and travels around the country and represents South Texas College of Law and carry that flag is a big deal, mm -hmm. right? If I had just done that, that would have been enough for me. I would have felt satisfied. Right. Um, but we were lucky. We won the intramurals. We got selected to be varsity advocates. Yeah. I ultimately competed in 15 tournaments around the whole United States representing my law school mm -hmm. against other students at their law schools. I won seven tournaments. I won a state championship, multiple regionals, and ultimately my last semester when my wife finally got on my mock trial team. When mm -hmm. I finally convinced Coach Treese, uh, who was our dean of advocacy, he's a legend, mm -hmm. legend in the world of advocacy. He's won more, I mean, John Wooden, um, Paterno, whatever names you can think of, he eclipses them in terms of wins and winning percentages. But he would never put us together. He did not want to put me with my wife on the same team. His fear was, what if you guys break up, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, man. Uh, so just like, just like a coach. <laughs> yes. I mean, in fact, you know what we called him? Coach. And, um, you know, Dean Treese is, is the, probably the, the 
It's the closest thing I've ever seen in my life to uh, John Wayne and okay. that persona that John Wayne brought when he walked into the room. I mean, Coach could walk into the room and take it over mm -hmm. just on a smile. And if he gets talking, you know what I mean? He'll really win you over. But he finally said, okay, Brant, that's, and he called me Stoggs. All right, Stoggs, I'll put you together. Mm -hmm. Last time, last semester. And I promised him, I said, I promise you, we won't, you know, we'll make you proud. Right. And so we went and competed in the Texas Regional. We beat all the Texas law schools. Then a month later, there was a national championship held in Miami, Florida, where the 14 champions from around the country came together and had a week long mock trial championship. Jennifer and I won that mm -hmm. national championship in our last semester of law school with my wife, mm -hmm. who ultimately became my wife. But interesting story. So I'm, um, the way it works in mock trial, you have a judge, and this was a real like sitting judge. We're in Miami, I can't remember what circuit this was, or remember his name. He calls balls and strikes, so to speak, on the objections and what comes in and comes out in evidence. And then you have three jurors that are in the box that are scoring you. Mm -hmm. And so I've got to convince these three jurors to vote for us. We need two of three, right? Right. And so there's this large African-American gentleman and he's looking at me the whole time and he's one of my three in the box. And between you and me, when, when we, we knew it was over, when we, when, when we closed our argument, we didn't think it was close. We thought the harder rounds, in fact, were getting out of Texas. Okay. Like beating the Texas schools is significantly more difficult than beating these East Coast schools, West Coast. I mean, <laughs> it's just the way it is. Um, but the guy comes up. Afterwards, we're shaking hands. I'm shaking hands with each of the jurors. And these are all practicing lawyers. These guys are you know, 30s, 40s, 50s, all stars in their field. And uh, he, we shake hands and he, and he pulls me in and he says, class of 81. Mm -hmm. And he'd noticed my Aggie ring. Oh, okay. He was wearing an Aggie ring too. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now we won it unanimous. We won all, got all three votes. But I turned to my team right after I said, we got his vote. <laughs> <laughs> Like I said, the Aggie network is strong. And I said, golly, it, found, it followed me to Miami and, and showed up here. So that's that, that's that looping it back in. But then so, you know, dream come true, right? We did everything we set out. Uh, we, we accomplished everything we set out to. Mm -hmm. We wanted to represent our school. We did that. We wanted to make a good showing. We did that. Ultimately, we wanted to be national champions. Mm -hmm. We did that. And then now what? Right? Now what? And so what are we going to do? What are mm -hmm. we going to do with these skills? Mm -hmm. Well, you can't do anything if you don't pass the bar. Right. So you roll right into taking the bar. Uh, my wife was fortunate enough, she got hired on by a, a plaintiff's firm right out of law school. Uh -huh. And so she's handling the BP Texas City explosion in 2005 when BP Texas City had their massive explosion. She's immediately on that trial team with this lawyer who's trying that case. Right. And, I'm, and I went to a defense firm and, uh, and the thought was, is, you know, coach, he set me up there. Coach was, look, you're gonna go to this defense firm because these guys are all South Texas advocates. Uh -huh. They know what you can do. They'll let you work your own docket of cases and they'll let you try cases young. I was like, okay. Um, so that's what I did. And ultimately tried a few cases in my first year mm -hmm. at what was Hayes McCon, which doesn't exist anymore. Uh, Mike Hayes, fantastic South Texas grad. He hired me. Um, the firm changed names and then split up. Um, but they trusted me. They let me get into the courtroom. They let me represent big clients on big cases, mm -hmm. uh, the partners stepped out of the way, let me give opening statement, cross the witnesses, do what I like to do. And so it, it, was, it was like my wife calls me, because she knew, we all knew. When we're in law school, you know, there's, there's classrooms you walk into that are named after Abraham Watkins law mm -hmm. firm, mm -hmm. this law firm. Um, there's courtrooms, mock courtrooms, that have Abraham Watkins on it. And anybody you talk to knows who this law firm is. And right. I didn't. From El Campo, I knew the hammer. Mm -hmm. right? we, we, we get his commercials yeah, down there all the time. Um, but I didn't know what Abraham Watkins was. But by the time I graduated, I did. Okay. And what I knew is it was the oldest personal injury firm in the state. It was the most prestigious firm around South Texas. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's you know if you talk to any of the trial people, the people who were litigators, the the lawyers who came in to help coach us and train us, right. and gave their time and effort, they all spoke highly of South Texas. Um, or of, of Abraham Watkins, the law firm, because I mean, some of the biggest names in, in, in our industry have come through here. They're mm -hmm. either still here, you know, Benny Gusto at the time, Randy Sorrells was a partner here, mm -hmm. um, former partners, and you had John O'Quinn, Ernest Cannon, uh, you had uh, you know, John Hill, Attorney General, you mm -hmm. had Curtis Brown, Fifth Circuit. You have all these legends of the law that all came through here. Right. 
And, and it's pretty unique that you see a law firm that's existing and continues to roll over the way ours does. Right. Uh, most law firms, you know, if it's the Stogner Atkinson law firm, mm -hmm. when we're done, we're done. Right. Right. You that's and I, it. we're going to the ranch. Um, but what's different about this one is new partners come in as the old partners age out. And so this, this, this machine, this um, institution gets to continue on. And that's what makes it so unique. And that's why it's, you know, over 70 years old and there aren't any other. Right. The law has been practiced in Texas for much longer than 70 years. Right. But our firm is the oldest in the personal injury world. Gotcha. So my wife calls me. She says, hey, Abraham Watkins is looking for an associate. I'm a two-year lawyer at this point. She says, hey, I was sitting with my boss. Benny Augusto just came by the table. He said, hey, we're looking to hire another associate. They want a five-year lawyer who's got 10 jury trials, board certified, yada, yada, yada. And, uh, <laughs> and so my wife calls me and she goes, I don't care what they want. Mm -hmm. you find a way to get into that interview and I tapped on every shoulder I could so not the first phone call I make is to coach mm -hmm. it's a coach you know Randy Sorrells you know Benny Augusto you know Nick Nichols I mean mm -hmm. we're talking about you know Nick he taught it at this law school so coach reached out got me an interview mm -hmm. got me in the room they told me I said hey you're not what we're looking for <laughs> they said uh, we're, we're talking to this district attorney who's leaving the DA's office he's got 70 jury trials right um and he's a seven or eight year lawyer and um we really like you but timing's not right you know a month later i get a call back and they say hey he declined the job we're going to do another round of interviews you're against one other guy right so i came in interviewed and oversold myself <laughs> as, can we you do, do, as we do as, as we, we do. do hey can you do this yes have you done this many times can you do this <laughs> you know i can just, you know, I'm going to win it with confidence and uh, I got the job. Uh -huh. Now I have to actually do everything I said I could do, right? <clears throat> Fear, you know, anxiety immediately snakes, right. uh, gets you. But it's like, look, this is, this is what I've done my whole life. At each level, I've gone up and wondered, is this where I'm finally going to reach, you know, where I can't progress? Mm -hmm. Whether it's go play college football against these guys from Houston and Dallas, these big cities. No, we're going to fight through it and we're going to make it work. Right. And there were times, I'll admit that, there were times here in the beginning where I was like, I don't know if this is for me, you know? Um, it's not like when you're a defense lawyer. Mm -hmm. When I was a defense lawyer, you walk in and go, here's a new lawsuit they filed against your client. You're up. So I'm in a defensive mode. We'll file an answer. What are your allegations? But when I got over here, I, it, it blew my mind how much work went into being a plaintiff's lawyer and how many dead ends you chased down before you found the case you actually filed. Mm -hmm. Right? That didn't exist on the defense side. We get a matter, we start working on the matter. We start billing whoever's paying. Um, but on the plaintiff side, you have to go out and help find these people. One, they have to trust you to hire you. Right. Two, uh, you have to make sure you know the law and get the facts before you even know if you're gonna file a lawsuit. Is this even something that we can win? Mm -hmm. And so uh, there were times where I, was, where I wasn't sure I could do it, but at the end of the day, I mean, it all clicked. At some point, like right around the year mark here when I was a young associate, it all started to click. And I had fantastic mentors, you know, that, that were working here with me. Mo Z's, Mo and I were both associates together. Mm -hmm. um, there's three partners that were here at the time. Eight to 10 of us were associates. Mm -hmm. um, Mo Z's and I immediately gravitated to, to each other, became close friends. Um, Mo's a first generation immigrant from Pakistan, hardest worker you've ever met. Um, and so I said, I'm gonna work with him. I'm gonna model <laughs> my work ethic. That's a smart move. Yeah, after him. <clears throat> Nobody can keep up. But I thought, you know, if I shoot for the moon, I might reach the treetops and that might be good enough. Mm -hmm. And so I saw Mo working and grinding. I started working and grinding. Um, and the two of us are the only two that are here from that time other than Benny. Mm -hmm. And so Benny Augusto, first generation immigrant from Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so here I am. My, my, and those are my two law partners now. So I felt like I'm kind of like that. Now, I'm not a first generation immigrant. Right. But I'm from country El Campo. <laughs> And, um, you know, I didn't have to learn a new language or anything, but I certainly had to learn this new world. Right. And so um, that's what, what I, when I laugh with my friends, I say, look, my, my law firm is, and I try to hire people like this, country boys, mm -hmm. first generation immigrants, mm -hmm. right? Military, mm -hmm. athletes. Mm -hmm. Why? I want hard workers. Right. Folks that know you just can't show up and win. Right. You got to put in the time, you got to put in the effort. And if you do all that with the talent, then you can win. You have a chance to win right. and nothing's guaranteed. So, Do you think that's how you kind of transitioned into being a partner at such a young age? Well, to being a partner at such a young age, right? So what the best thing about this law firm, it is not about how long you've been here. 
That is not what this is about. Now, I face some of that at other jobs. Well, we can't bump you up because so-and-so has been here longer. It'll upset the apple cart. Fair enough. That's not an organization I want to be in. Mm -hmm. So what Abraham Watkins did is it's an, the law firm is it's a meritocracy. You move as fast as you can here, depending on how much money you can bring in. It's a simple fact. Right. And, and for our job, that's the measure of success because we can't turn back the hands of time and, and uh, to help our injured victims or bring back a loved one. The law that we use, uh, Texas allows us to convert those losses, those damages into money. And so one easy way to measure the success of a plaintiff's firm is how much money are you getting for your clients? Right. And so the same thing happened here is, is how hard are you working? Are you generating new cases? Right. And so the one thing I could do because I'm from the area mm -hmm. and I bartended here and I went to college here for a while and A&M is I had a network. Right. And so I went ahead and tapped into my network and started trying to bring as much business as I could to this firm. Mo did the same thing. Um, and ultimately, you either have to bring in a bunch of business or you have to be working really hard with great results on other people's cases. Right. So the way you make partner here truly is be able to generate new money that the partnership wouldn't have had. Right. If I'm simply robbing Peter to pay Paul, that's not increasing the pie. Right. And so why Mo and I both made partner early is because we, we understood that. It's a business. Mm -hmm. It's not walking around and, and, and brown nosing or asking how your weekend was. What it is is increasing everybody's bottom line right. and doing a good job for your clients. And so we, we say this in our job. Say, look, when I hire, if I'm hiring you, I would say, look, I don't care if you're a bleeding heart. Like, I like those. It's fine. Or if you're a greedy, you know, you just want to get as much money for you and your family as you can. It mm -hmm. won't matter because mm -hmm. the result will be the same for my clients right. and the firm's clients. If your motivation is money, you're going to go out and you're going to work your butt off to get a bunch of money because we get a percentage of that mm -hmm. and that goes to you. If your motivation is to solve all the world's problems and right the wrongs that we see in our cases mm -hmm. and you do a good job at that, you're going to make your client a bunch of money. So whatever your motivation is, whether it's greed or bleeding heart or somewhere in between, you're ultimately going to be able to do a good job for the client, which is who we work for. And right. that's ultimately you know, the most important person here is the client. The second most important person here, we believe, is the referral lawyer mm -hmm. or the, the source who got us the case, mm -hmm. right? We, but first and foremost, is going to be the client. Mo made partner first. He got here first. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I got here. I made partner second, but we were both extremely young when we did it, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and one of the things we did as associates that the others weren't doing mm -hmm. is we were trying cases, right? We were, we were going to the courthouse, getting results, win, lose, or draw. Mm -hmm. trying cases, get that experience, get that experience. So that Mo and I both became board certified very early in our careers. I did it at the five year mark, which is the soonest you can do it. Mm -hmm. I think Mo did it as well at the five year mark. Um, we both got into a BOTA, American Board of Trial Advocates, mm -hmm. most prestigious lawyer organization there is. We got in early mm -hmm. before we're even in our forties. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was our goal, right? I want to do everything as fast as I can be the first to do this, the first to do that. I want the largest verdict. I want the largest settlement. And I want to do that because it's going to help my clients. It's going to ultimately help my clients and help me and my family. Gotcha. So hitting on the clients, um, I think we do a good job of outreach here. So I think that's kind of the reason for this, this hot start in 2023. We brought in a lot of high profile cases. The newest one that comes to mind is a couple weeks ago, um, a young man, a young father was driving down the freeway and uh, a tire off a truck hit him and, and, and ultimately took, took his life and he was uh, a father of a four month old. Right. Can you kinda, I know you, we just started getting the case, we can't talk too much about it, but from what you can talk about, can you kinda share about that sure. case? Yeah, so, so just to kinda recap the facts, a uh, young lady, 20 year old, she's driving with her boyfriend, 21 year old. Okay. They're coming, they've come to Houston to have dinner and have a night out on a date. They're now driving back to Katy, Texas where they're from, so that's I-10. Right. They're heading westbound on I-10, um, and all of a sudden, a tire is catapulted from eastbound lanes mm -hmm. over the HOV, mm -hmm. lands on their windshield, mm -hmm. crashes in, kills her boyfriend, mm -hmm. kills him, 21-year-old young man, and severely injures her face, causes her to wreck the vehicle, obviously. Right. Right. Uh, the young man, Clayton, who, who passed away, leaves behind a four-month-old baby and a mother who, who's just, they're just destroyed. Uh, so we, re we represent the injured girlfriend, and then we also represent the 
the family members of this of the young man who died in this wreck. I mean, just think of the bad luck, mm -hmm. you know. And this is all of our worst fear. Mm -hmm. You're doing everything you're supposed to be doing. You're looking at the road in front of you, at the car, making sure you're following distance, your speed. And from over here, a tire comes in, like projectile in a, you know, something out of Twister, the movie, mm -hmm. flies in your windshield, kills your passenger, hits you glass in the face. She's got lacerations all over her face, stitches. Mm -hmm. She's this beautiful young girl is gonna have to deal with this recovery. So where'd it come from? Mm -hmm. Where'd the tire come from? Mm -hmm. Everybody saw the story on the news. It was all over the news on April 13th. I-10 in Bunker Hill, tire case, et cetera, et cetera. But it wasn't until recently that we learned where the tire came from. So mm -hmm. the constable's office at Precinct 5 worked this case, um, and they've, they've figured out who was driving the truck, mm -hmm. which company he worked for, mm -hmm. and apparently it was a welding trailer that was being dragged or, or pulled by this work truck. Now, what I don't know yet, and I haven't, because I haven't been able to speak to the officers, um, they're still in the middle of their investigation. It's, mm -hmm. The crash report hasn't even come out. We'll get a lot more information when the crash report is generated. But I don't know, did, was this tire rolling in use and mm -hmm. it popped off? Was this on a trailer improperly secured mm -hmm. that all of a sudden was rolling down the highway? But as you can imagine, the tire's coming 70 miles an hour eastbound. Mm -hmm. We're coming 70 miles an hour westbound. Mm -hmm. And what we think is that another vehicle struck the tire, propelled it over, and so we're, it, it could be as much force as 140 miles per hour wow. on the two meet. Um, so just a tragic case. And, and our heart goes out to you know, the family of, of poor Clayton who passed away at such a young age. And it was all over the news. So, and how um, do you investigate that type of thing? How does that, you get the case in, you, you've seen on the news, but how do, you, how do you find out about the tire? How do you find out about the company? What was the normal investigation on these type of cases? Well, I mean, first and foremost, we need to identify who we're dealing with. Uh, sometimes we know that right away. Obviously, mm -hmm. if our clients are alive and took photos at the scene, we can figure that out. Give me an 18-wheeler wreck. I get, a, I get a photograph of that US DOT number. Mm -hmm. Once I know that, I know everything, mm -hmm. right? Um, but sometimes, like here, we didn't know where it came from. So on this one, we're going to need the help of, the, of those local boots-on-the-ground law enforcement officers mm -hmm. uh, to help identify that. It right. doesn't mean we accept everything, but they gather the evidence for us. Right. Well, one of the first things we'll do here is, is, a, is, is retain an accident reconstructionist, mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, as we learn more, we'll try to potentially retain someone on regulations with regards to tying down a tire or securing a tire or pre-trip inspecting a tire. It'll be someone who's in, this, in the field of auto you know, transportation. Okay. Um, eventually, the crash report comes out. We're going to file a lawsuit, I can tell you that. Right. And then how we investigate from there is we get to use written discovery. We okay. can send questions to the company, driving record, qualification file. Uh, did you, you know, send me your pre-trip inspections? Right. Um, what are your policies and procedures on tie downs for cargo, mm -hmm. uh, payload, right. things like that? Uh, we'll start taking depositions. We'll put the driver under oath. We'll put the company, uh, his, his supervisor under oath, the corporate representative under oath. Okay. And we will try to get to the bottom through discovery, through our firm investigator, through our various experts that we hire accident reconstructionist, industrial hygienist, biomechanics, whatever we need to get, we will get to the bottom of it. Okay. Um, and eventually all this is designed to prepare us for trial. Right. You know, all these ingredients we're getting together, we're going to try to bake the best cake we can for the clients. Okay. Um, when it's an automotive case, the, the DPS, HPD, constable's office, they do a lot of the initial work for us. Okay. Who, what, when, where. But usually what I got to figure out is the why. Why yeah. did this happen? Yeah. Like you can sit here and say, well, this happened, but why? Yeah. Why'd right. that tire come through our windshield? Right. Okay. It shouldn't happen. Right. That's my goal. Okay. That makes a lot of sense on, on the whole, whole process. Now, um, kind of tying in these kind of, these pieces goes into another case I want to talk about is, um, a little boy that was hit and killed by the same school, not school van, that drove him home. I know now, which case you're talking about. That's uh, Villa Franca. So yes. now tell me how, maybe how that one differs because one's an autom automotive case. You're driving on a freeway. We've all we've all done this, and something un uh, unlucky happens. Right. This one was more of just negligence and, and not paying attention. True. Now before I move on to talk about that, I'll say yes, unlucky from the perspective of our clients on this tire case. Mm -hmm. But I guarantee you. We'll get to the bottom of it. It's going to be somebody failed to do what they were supposed okay. to do. Okay. Failed to tie down the tire, failed to inspect the tire. Gotcha. I guarantee you that. 
But what you're talking about with Isaac Villafranca, it's maybe the saddest case we have in the building, in my opinion. Um, it's a young nine-year-old boy. He lives too close to his school to ride the bus system, so he can't take the bus. But there's a lady in the neighborhood for a fee, $20 a week or something, will pick up the kids that are all similarly situated who right. can't ride the bus, and she'll get them to and from school. And so this lady uh, is dropping Isaac off at his house, nine-year-old boy. She has a van that only opens on the passenger side. Okay. She pulls up next to Isaac's house to his driveway where Isaac's house is on her left side. Mm -hmm. Out her left side, she would see Isaac's mom and Isaac's grandmother who's shown up that day because the two of them are going to take Isaac to get ice cream. They okay. can't wait for him to get home. Okay. There's the van. Isaac's pulling up. By the way, there's 12 to 13 other students, kids, on, the on this van. Mm -hmm. So Isaac opens the sliding door, looks, doesn't get hit by any traffic, walking around the front of the van. As you're supposed to do. As you're supposed to do. Okay. So he doesn't get pinned between the van. Right. The one person on the planet that's on the roadway that knows that kid is coming right. is the van driver. Right. So as Isaac is walking in front of the van, guess what she does? She drives forward, drives over him, mm -hmm. kills this nine-year-old boy, kills right. him right in front of his mother and grandmother right. and his 12 classmates. This woman today, it, to my knowledge, unless something's happened yesterday or while we're doing this podcast, mm -hmm. this woman has never been charged. Never. So we get the case. We file a lawsuit. We right. do a full-blown press conference. Uh, this is the case where that same woman who ran this little boy over mm -hmm. gift-deeded her house right. to her children the very next day. Which is not legal, right? <laughs> well, it, it's, what she doesn't know is we probably can't get to her house anyway under homestead laws. But sure does look culpable. Right. If the very next day, guilty. while my clients, while my clients are trying to plan the funeral of their nine-month-old baby, mm -hmm. she's moving assets. Right. That bothers me. Yeah, that's hard. Really to bothers me. Yeah. She hasn't been charged. She. So my clients, we're taking this to trial. Right. Do we know what's going on with that? At no, all? Like not from a criminal standpoint. We yeah, don't. Just, okay. I can tell you from where we are in our case. Mm -hmm. We're in the written discovery phase. We're going to put this woman under oath. She's going to have to answer questions. You know, district attorney's office doesn't want a prosecutor. Or Jacinto police chief doesn't want to question her. Mm -hmm. We do. Right. And my client, that's why they hired us. They want justice. And if we can't get it through the criminal courthouse, we're not going to take a settlement. Right. It's not going to happen. This case is going to be tried to a Harris County jury, and we're going to let the jury tell that woman what she did to this family. Right. And she's going to get assessed with all those damages. Um, and during your investigation, can you subpoena, I guess, cell phone records to see if she was on the phone while, while this happened? Um, any kind of, I know sometimes there's like a black box on, on, these, on these vehicles. Right. So we have that, the black box data. Um, we, we're through discovery, mm -hmm. written questions. Tell us your cell phone carrier and your mm -hmm. cell phone number. Mm -hmm. They have to. Mm -hmm. If she won't, we'll make the court make her. Okay. Then what's going to happen is we're going to send a subpoena with deposition on written questions to her provider, AT&T, Sprint, whoever. Okay. We want all the messages. We want all the calls for that day. I just don't, for the life of me, understand how you can drop a kid off mm -hmm. and move your tires one inch you. until you see that kid over here with his mom and grandma. Right. I, it just, of all the cases we have in the building, this one is one of the strangest. Mm -hmm. Right? This is the one person who's not going to run you over. is going to be the very person who dropped you off. Right. Um, but yeah, the, the mom and dad are understandably distraught, destroyed. The mm -hmm. grandmother had to witness this to her grandbaby. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, this one's going to trial. Now, who's responsible in that kind of case? Is it, is it solely the, the driver? Is it um, the van company? Do, they have, do, do we know if they have an actual company? Is it just like a fly-by-night kind of situation? Is the school district uh, responsible for allowing this to happen? What's, um, I guess, well, what's the law? First and foremost, the law is going to be against the driver on negligent operation. Right. What she committed was negligence, probably gross negligence, mm -hmm. right? Um, with regard to the van, we're dealing with a very old van. So mm -hmm. under Texas law, the statute of repose is 15 years. Okay. So I cannot bring a product defect case against the van, even if I had a theory. And the theory might be some kind of early collision warning. In right. other words, as Isaac's walking in front, doo -doo -doo -doo, some kind of Yeah, do they, do they force them to have some kind of pole that comes out right, or... Right. Or a well, see, protection system? Unfortunately here, no, because we're dealing with an old van, so I can't sue for a product defect on a van that's over 15 years ago manufactured. Okay. You ask about the, the school district. Well, yeah. the school district didn't approve 
had nothing to do with this one. Yeah, this was a they don't know what's going on. They don't. This was a local neighborhood uh, lady that went house to house and said, I'll take your kids. And so, you know, the school district um, can only be hit under Texas law anyway, I'll just tell you this. Mm -hmm. The school district can only be hit under Texas law for motor vehicle negligence. And you're going to say, oh, this is motor vehicle negligence. It's not a school district employee operating it. It's not a school district employee mm -hmm. directing so it, inspecting it. it. They yeah. have nothing to do with it. Mm -hmm. It's hard enough to hold a, an independent school district liable anyway under the Texas Tort Claims Act. Mm -hmm. It's hard to sue the government. <laughs> okay. Let's just be honest. It's hard to sue the government. Right. Um, there are caps. There's limitations, rare exceptions. And so it's, it's uh, and in this scenario, the factual case doesn't even look like the, that the ISD is at fault. Right. Okay. Unfortunately, this looks to be one person's, you know, clear negligence and gross negligence, but it's not. And then they tried to cover it up after the fact. You know, she's trying to hide assets. That's the only thing I can think of is, is that that's exactly what this is. You know, it shows a guilty heart. Right, there's nothing to cover up. Yeah. Everybody knows what you. They're did. not. They're not sorry. Are they? Are they still? Are they still running the, the service now? They were the last I checked. They were the very next day. I can tell you that. Wow. Now the driver who ran over Isaac wasn't driving, but her husband was. So okay. And, and so the whole kids got to get to school. Yeah. I you know I understand. Yeah, but, but it's, the day after. I know it's 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 a fact of life and it's in poor taste. Um, but that's what Texas law allows us to do. It allows right. us, and that's what the the parents have hired me to do is to bring what's called a wrongful death case. Your negligence and gross negligence caused the death of my son. Mm -hmm. Okay, It's the same thing the DA can bring. It's called criminally negligent homicide. Mm -hmm. The DA just has to prove it beyond reasonable doubt with 12 of 12. I have to prove that, more likely than not, by a preponderance of the evidence, and get 10 of 12. Mm -hmm. But the DA and I would have the exact same elements to prove. Mm -hmm. So that's why I, you know, I'm, I'm shocked to this day that this woman's not being prosecuted at all. and we're going full bore. Right. And right. It's, and it's been several months, so they've had ample time to at least do something. Right. Right. And, you know, well, because we're going to get justice you, one way or the other. If you hit and kill somebody in an auto accident on the freeway, they're going to investigate. Absolutely. It seems like they haven't done any work on it. Well, it was in the news and Jacinto's, uh, Jacinto City Police Department did the investigation and mm -hmm. the, the, the police chief gave his remarks at that time, mm -hmm. and that's it. Okay. That's that. So after that, let's transition from, unfortunately, one sad thing to another sad case or cases that we have here, um, but the other end of the of the of the funnel, if you will. Those were them coming in. These are these have just these have just settled. Um, I'm talking about um, two young boys under six years old. Both uh, ended up uh, passing away and drowning in apartment. Pools. Can you kind of touch on those? Because they they did reach huge settlements. They were, I believe, they were the number one and number two in U.S. history for single child death drownings that's in the United what, States. Well, that's what happens. I'll talk about I'll talk about the the Moki case first. Um, um, this involved a, a young boy who lived at an apartment complex here in Houston, mm -hmm. a lower end apartment complex. Mm -hmm. He had uh, multiple siblings. He just had a two-week-old sister born. Mm -hmm. uh, his mom and his dad are going to host an event that evening at their apartment unit mm -hmm. for their church. Mm -hmm. So dad has been sent by mom to go to the laundromat with the two older boys, get them, get, get all the stuff clean. Right. Mom's at home with the two-week-old baby breastfeeding. And the six-year-old boy, the six-year-old son, Elijah, um, he was watching cartoons in the living room. Mm -hmm. Now, it's one of those apartment complexes where they have the swimming pool, and basically a two-story unit fully surrounding it. Right. So it's not uncommon for Elijah to walk out, play on his stairs like all the other kids, mm -hmm. but they can't get into the swimming pool because it's fully gated, fully locked, right? Right, okay. And so on this particular day, mom's in the back breastfeeding the newborn, the two-week-old. Elijah, unfortunately, was able to get out of the house, mm -hmm. but again, not uncommon. Um, it's a gated community. Doors, doors were locked. Doors were locked, but this is a tall kid. Mm -hmm. And so he goes down, he uh, can't, can't, uh, from my understanding, you can't add extra safety latches to you because it's an apartment, it's not your house. That's right. So, so they, don't, they don't allow you to add extra locks on the door. By statute, uh, tenants in an apartment complex, multifamily rental unit cannot alter the lock mechanisms. Right. Right. Imagine you're the landlord and all of a sudden you're locked out. Yeah, you need to get into your unit because you own it. <laughs> they got right. four locks on there. Okay. So this always comes up in the context of when when I when I handle a child drowning case at an apartment or condominium, 
uh, what's always going to be alleged is going to be contributory negligence by the defendant against my mom and dad or mom, dad, whoever's taking care of the kid. Right. And the argument is you should have child-proofed your house. You should have never let this kid out. You should have mm -hmm. locked him in, barred the door. But unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your viewpoint, we can't alter those locking mechanisms. Mm -hmm. So Elijah gets out. Mm -hmm. But he can't get in the pool because the pool is fully fenced and has a self-closing, self-latching gate. Right. But what the pool does is it has a brick wall that abuts the perimeter fence, which is wrought iron, mm -hmm. then a two-foot brick wall that abuts the four-foot brick wall. So a ladder. Essentially a stair step. Okay. So what the children were doing, because we deposed the other tenants, the, the police department spoke to other tenants, mm -hmm. what the children were doing is they were using stepping onto the two-foot wall, going to the four-foot wall, walking to the edge, and simply jumping into the pool area. Okay. Now we can get in. We, we don't even need the code. Now this happened during COVID, so the pool was locked shut. I mean, right. completely chained shut. Right. But all of a sudden, uh, when my client comes out after she finished feeding the baby, Elijah's not in the living room. She mm -hmm. walks immediately out to her, she's on the second story. She walks out, sees him floating in the pool. Mm. She starts screaming, as any one of us would do, see your own baby. And um, neighbors, other people who live there, come out, see what she sees. Every single person who needed to get into that pool to try to save that boy, mm -hmm. used the exact same brick walls. Right. Now what we found out is those brick walls had been there forever. Right. They're clearly a climbing hazard. They're permanent structures. Permanent structures. Yeah. And the Texas, the, from the National Code to the Texas Code to the, to the Houston Ordinances, everything says the same thing. You cannot have any climbing hazards near your perimeter fence. Mm -hmm. They go a step further. You can't even have permanent structures within three feet of your perimeter fence. Makes sense. For this reason. Right. Right? So first responders, HPD, EMS, every single person who was dealing with Elijah that day went to the exact same brick wall and got over it. Mm -hmm. Had never even been there. Right. It was just that apparent to them that that's how you get yeah. in. And so obviously we brought, you know, the, the family hired my law firm and me. And so we brought the lawsuit against the apartment complex, against the management company that handled it. Um, and, our, and our position was clear. Like, look, you have a statutory violation with regard to your pool. Mm -hmm. to its perimeter fencing. You have a common law violation and that this is a clear premises defect, right? right? You're running an attractive nuisance with a swimming pool and you have a clear premises defect. So you either need to fix it or make it safe. Mm -hmm. And they didn't either. So they were already warned previous by, well, the, by the city or whoever. It depends if you, who you believe, right? So when we took the deposition of the manager, she uh, testified, oh no, nobody had ever told me any problems. I was never aware of any problems. Never, never, never. But when we, we start talking to tenants, they say, oh, there's people swimming the day before. This is how kids get in and out of the pool. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, when we spoke to the city of Houston and its pool inspectors, mm -hmm. they said, oh yeah, we told them back in 2017, that's a climbing hazard. Right, okay. But they couldn't ding them because it was a grandfathered issue, they thought. But the mm -hmm. bottom line is the pool, the, the apartment complex was New. told, was told, yeah. tear down that wall. Right. And they didn't do it until after this little boy drowned. They did it literally the day after he drowned. So they did tear it down. They tore it down, thank God. I mean, okay. a little late. Uh -huh. But I mean, at least if that prevents any other kid from drowning, that's a win in my book. Uh -huh. uh, but that case ultimately settled. It was a wrongful death case, uh -huh. once again. We're bringing a wrongful death case for the mother and the father of this six-year-old boy uh -huh. who lost his life in that pool. Right. And the case settled for $12 million. Right. Okay. Now that would be, that would have set, that would have set the record, uh -huh. but the, the, the Sweeney case, uh -huh which we'd worked just two and settled two months earlier, settled for 18 million. Right, okay. Which is, according to Verdict Search 2023, right. when, we, when we checked, right. um, Verdict Search said that was the highest reported single death drowning settlement in US history. Right, okay. Which obviously I'm proud of to be a part of. I'm proud that that's what we were able to do. Mm -hmm. I was able to get here for my clients because th those two people lost their four and a half year old son mm -hmm. and it was their only one. Yeah, tell me about the, the details of that one because that one's a little different. Yeah. It's got some similarities as well. It's got some overlap, right? So as we head into pool season, I get nervous because I know, I just know there's going to be 10 drownings in the greater Houston area this summer at apartment complexes for this reason. And so this case is sad. What we have here is we have a little boy who mom, mom and dad are at the apartment complex. This is out in Baytown, Texas. Okay. Dad works security, so he literally works all night. Mm -hmm. He gets home at 7.30 a.m. and he goes to sleep. Mm -hmm. He played with his little boy for about an hour and he went to sleep. Mom stays up now with the little boy. 
she is having an absolute, uh, she's sick as a dog. Mm -hmm. She's in the bathroom vomiting, et cetera, et cetera. And so she, her testimony is she was in there for five to 10 minutes. And when she comes out, uh, James was the little boy, he's no longer there. Mm -hmm. She looks down, the door is open. Mm -hmm. She runs out the door. Mm -hmm. She sees a maintenance man driving around on a golf cart. She's screaming bloody murder for him. He comes, the two of them start scouring the apartment complex. Now, once again, this is a fully gated community. Right. And this was a beautiful apartment complex. Right. But still, uh, you, can't, you can't change the locking mechanisms on these doors. Right. And we face this in this case again. The, the defense lawyers once again complained and blamed my clients, saying they should have barred the door or somehow otherwise prevented the kid from getting out. Right. Bottom line is, he was tall enough to turn the deadbolt, and right. they can't add anything else. Right. But as exactly. we told the court, and the judge and anybody who'd listen, mm -hmm. that little boy gets out of that apartment complex, he faces some, some risks, but none of them are drowning. Right. right. He may get hit by a car, he may stub his toe, break his arm, but he doesn't leave the premises and he doesn't get in the pool. Right. Once again, it's a pool perimeter gate issue. Now this place had a perfectly working gate, met the height requirements, met the slat requirements, had a perfectly working uh, double safety system on their latch. Mm -hmm. So to get into the pool, if you wanted to go swim, mm -hmm. you would have had to know their code, mm -hmm. doo -doo -doo, turn the handle, and be tall enough to pull up the magna lock. Now do then you know how long the, the lock was off the ground? Like six feet? It, it feet? was too tall for the kid to reach. Right. Okay. We know that because an ADA expert testified in the case that the child would never have been able to reach it. But they have, so what you have here is an apartment complex that has a perfectly working fence system, perfectly working gate. Mm -hmm. with a double security system on it. Mm -hmm. Perfect. But the problem was, this little four and a half year old boy was able to walk right up, pull, and the gate open. Mm -hmm. He didn't have to use the code, he didn't have to lift the latch because there was a chain that was hanging there preventing the gate from fully closing and latching. Okay. So the chain literally hangs there. It looks like it's closed, but it never latched. Okay. This boy gets into the pool, he ends up fighting for his life for three minutes. We had it on video camera. Now that's the apartment's chain. That's the apartment complex's chain. They use that chain. Well, at first I'm asking whose chain is it and why is it there? Right. Right. So Baytown PD comes out, they photograph the scene. We see this chain there and all the write-up says, you know, this kid was able to gain entry to the pool without having to use the code. Because of the chain. Why is that chain there? So we file suit. We put the, we put the apartment complex manager under oath. She's no longer with the company at the time I take her deposition. Okay. So she's willing to sing. She's willing to tell the truth. What she tells me under oath is that chain has been there for five years. That she had seen people, mm -hmm. tenants, landscapers, vendors, people who were continuously going in and out of the pool area, prop that chain over so they didn't have to use the code. It was inconvenient. Mm -hmm. And of course my question is, you saw that? Yes. Before the drowning? Mm -hmm. Yes. What'd you do? Well, I went and you know, moved it off so it would shut. Why not cut the chain off altogether? Mm -hmm. well, I should have, but you left it there. Yeah, and yeah. that's acquiescence to others doing it in the future. And so what happened is, had they simply cut the chain down when they saw other people using the chain to defeat their statutorily required safety systems at their pool, right. this little boy would still be with us. Right. But ultimately what it came down to is it was inconvenient to have to put in that code and lift the latch every time. Right. And Which is the whole point of safety and security for these for these type of incidents. Who's the most vulnerable person on that property? It's the children who can't swim. Right. And these codes are only as good as if they're used. And so here in this scenario, they had all the tools. Mm -hmm. They just used the chain to defeat it. And of course, after the kid drowns, they cut the chain off. Mm -hmm. Too late, right? If it prevents somebody else from drowning, I'm, you know, that, that, that's great. It feels like the third case we've talked about mm -hmm. where they did something the next day instead of doing it beforehand to prevent the bad thing from happening. Right, right. And, and, and when you ask them in these cases, when you ask them repeatedly why this wasn't done before, they either tell you, oh, I didn't know, which turns out to be un untrue, mm -hmm. or it turns out they didn't care. Yeah. That's what it comes down to. Negligence. It's negligence. It's the failure to do what a reasonable person or reasonable company would have done in the same or similar circumstances. I mean, so if you have a pool, if you have a swimming pool and you have a gate around it, obviously you're trying to protect someone. Mm -hmm. But what good is that if you hang a chain over it where I can just walk up and, and use it? Exactly. it? It'd be like this. You've seen people prop open those fences. Because what happens is when the pool gate closes, it closes on its own, it latches. Right. We've seen people put a garbage can there before right. so they can let all their buddies in. Yep. But this was worse. 
Because a garbage can, you would have walked by as a tenant and said, something's wrong. Why is that pool gate propped mm -hmm. over? This chain allowed it to where it looked closed. You couldn't even no tell. one knew, right? Apartment complex knew. Mm -hmm. Maintenance guy knew. Yeah, they put it there. Yeah, they, they had it there. When we deposed the maintenance guy, he testified he'd seen it done like that three or four times, and he knew who did it. I said, well, who was that? It was my underling, the guy that works for me. Yeah. <laughs> and so it was a travesty, because then when we talked to the corporate representative of the management company, he lies under oath and says, oh, I never knew there was a chain there. Mm -hmm. His manager's already testified she had multiple discussions with him mm. about the chain. Um, it, it, I could spend three days talking about that case and what they tried to do to assassinate these poor people. But ultimately, at the end of the day, the trial judge, in our situation, it was Judge Lauren Reeder, um, she ultimately agreed with us in our position, which is there is no contributory negligence on mom or dad. Dad's asleep. Mm -hmm. Mom's in the bathroom. And there's no way proximate cause could ever happen where it would be foreseeable they would get into this swimming pool unless they were told the chain was there propping it open. Of course, apartment complex never told anyone. Mm -hmm. So boom, they, the judge struck all their claims against mom and dad. Um, the, the apartment complex tried to blame other tenants, saying, well, the other tenants should have warned this family mm -hmm. about the dangers of the pool in general, mm -hmm. but, not about, but it made no sense. The judge struck that. Mm -hmm. The judge ultimately agreed with us when we moved for net worth discovery on the defendant management company and apartment complex right. that there's a substantial likelihood that we're going to prevail on, on a gross negligence claim. Those are all the makings. This story, that's how you get an $18 million settlement on a single death drowning. Mm -hmm. Not only were they bad, they were grossly bad. Right. They tried to cover it up. They tried to assassinate the mom and dad, and it all blew up in their face. Right. And the jury was going to hear all that. And, the, and they sent the police on a wild goose chase, too, right? Right, right. So what happened is, after this drowning, the apartment complex told the detectives that the mom, who's sitting there holding her dead baby, crying. I have it on the body cam, like from the officers there, holding her dead baby. The apartment complex manager was going up to detectives and volunteering information. Hey, she told me she left and went to the store for a few minutes. Mm -hmm. So naturally, the detectives think, did this lady leave and go to the store and leave her baby here to drown? Mm -hmm. They went and checked every surveillance video they had going in or out. They went to every single store, because my client didn't have a car, went to every single store within a five-mile radius that where she could have walked to, pulled the entry and exit surveillance videos. So this is these are... Law enforcement There's officers, hours, of, of hours upon hours of time where they were sent on a wild goose chase. And they all confirmed she never left the property. She was in her apartment complex. We can see her on the video coming out, screaming, looking for her son. We can see her flag down the maintenance guy. We see them drive all over the place. So it, it doesn't get much worse than this, yeah. right? Had they simply come out right out the gate, admitted they were at fault, then I don't think you get an $18 million settlement. But it was their refusal, 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 mm -hmm. and every lie that we Trying were able to cover to, it up. Yes, it's the cover up. And we were able to prove that they were lying. So in other words, they drown the kid, they try to kill mom and dad through assassination of their character, and then, and then pretend they didn't know about it. Right. And so, I mean, that, that, those have all the makings of what was gonna be a tremendous jury verdict. Right. Tremendous. Right. 30, 50, a huge number. Gotcha. And that's why the defendants offered enough to where my clients said, you know what, I would rather have that number than go risk what you know a jury might think. Mm -hmm. but, but I say this over and over, and you've heard me. They would trade every penny they got to have their little boy back. Right. I agree, too. Oh, well, I think, uh, I think we can wrap it up there. I, I definitely think we can, uh, we can talk for hours and hours, and I'm sure we'll, we'll have you on again here in the future. But uh, thank you, everybody, for... Uh, for listening and we will talk to you later. Thank you.